Glad you all came tonight. Glad I found it. Jacob led me astray, put me to Windsor Heights, but um, I outsmarted him and found my way here. If I hadn't, he'd been teaching tonight. It would have been great. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is John Schreiner, and uh, I went to Drake University back, graduated in 06, and uh, it was there that I became a Christian my freshman year. Grew up in Minnesota, went to school here, became a Christian my freshman year, and then I couldn't leave. Uh, I did get my business degree, which led to being uh, on staff and doing campus ministry at Grandview. So I did that for a number of years, and then I did uh, part-time there and part-time at Drake. And it was really awesome until about three years ago, I became the pastor of our South location. So me and John Crane are down there making things happen. Um, it was about 10 years ago, 12 years ago that I was sitting where you guys are, though. I was uh, in Epicenter, and uh, it was awesome. Epicenter was so good. I loved it. I give big time plugs for it. It was my first time I started to read the Bible for real was in, during Epicenter, like consistently, daily, was because of Epicenter. Well, it's because of the Lord, but the program of Epicenter really helped me get on the right track with that. Um, understanding how I could reach out to the community. Soccer, Central City Soccer started that first year, my sophomore year, and it was awesome um, being a part of the inner city. You know, we were in the Evelyn Davis neighborhood, and, and they were like, don't be out here past dark, and we didn't know what we were doing, and there's been a number of shootings since then, but we're all still here. So, um, and, you know, now it's 12 years later, and I'm still doing Central City Soccer. I've coached every year since then. My son is six years old, and I'll be coaching his team this year uh, at our Southside League. So um, I have a picture of my family so that, you know, they're, they're, I think I have a picture of my family. Do we? Oh, just kidding. That's a fail. My bad. Um, they're really cute. You guys, it would have made the talk way better. So... It's okay. I do have a, I've been married for seven years to Jenny, and we've got four kids. Uh, Owen's six, Eden's four, Ada's two, and Henry's ten months. It's been pretty great, um, pretty awesome. But before we start, I thought I should tell you guys one of my favorite stories from Drake University. Uh, I know it's not just Drake here, but um, Tim Greeno, he shared with me the big hand story from last week. And uh, I was like, well, if you've got a big hand story, then I'm going to tell my story too. Uh, we were, this was my senior year. We were coming back from Big Blue, and we were right outside the health center. So those of you who know Drake, you know the health center. It's the wood building coming back from Greek Street. And we were on the sidewalk. So I'm walking down the sidewalk, and it's me and Jason Rude and Chris Sotowasser. I can never remember the fourth person. It was either Big Red Fury or Brad Buns, but there's four of us. And they were all freshmen, and I was a senior. Uh, as their RA, and we're coming back, and this, this late 80s Caprice Classic rolls up. So he's, he's coming the opposite direction. So we're going this way, and he pulls up this way, and we're on the sidewalk. And uh, he, he's like, hey, man. And I was like, oh, no. I'm like, just keep walking, guys. You know, I don't know what he wants. And I think he's trying to sell me drugs, because he definitely was not a Drake student. I mean, it was like um, these two Latino guys in this Caprice Classic, and they turned their lights off, so it was extra shady. And then he's like, hey, man, da, da, da. and I was, like, I was like, no, we don't want any. And then he's like, what you say? And I was like, oh, crap, you know, like, <laughs> so we just keep walking. I'm like, just keep going, guys. So we're just, I'm trying to get the distance between me and the Caprice Classic. And um, he's like, what you say? And then the passenger gets out of the car. This is a true story. He gets out, and so we're going this way, and he walks towards us. And out of his pants strip, he pulls out a gun. He's like, give us your wallets. And um, it was really funny because he was like, 15 yards away at this point. Like, if you're going to rob somebody, like, stop them. You know, you, it's too late. We're not giving you our wallets. Um, and so he just kept walking, and he actually had a gun, not just big hands, and we survived. It was really awesome. Um, moral of the story, if you want to be a pastor in the church, you probably need to get robbed at gunpoint or something at some point to, to have a chance. Some of you maybe are on your way there. Uh, it was pretty funny. All right, well, that's not really what I want to talk about today. I have more things to talk about than myself, so let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you, you love us, that you give us each other, that you give us the church, that you, um, you bless us so much. I pray that tonight you, we would remember your blessing, we would remember um, how you instruct us, we would learn from your word, um, 
God, I pray that, that it would be clear tonight that we would examine your, your word and, and see the benefit of the church in teaching us how to live and in instructing us. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the, the blessing of the church, the administration of the church. We thank you uh, for all that you do and all that you're doing. Help us tonight to learn. Amen. Okay. So I understand that the topic this summer is the church. And so when Jacob sent out the email, I was pretty excited about this topic. I started to prepare it and I got a little bit nervous because it's way bigger than I can cover uh, in you know, the time I have. So it might be a little bit scattered because I have more I want to say and I tried to condense it and then I feel like I missed things. So bear with me. Um, but I'm going to talk about something a little bit controversial. Uh, at least it'll feel controversial. I don't think, actually think it is, but it would be easy to feel that way. Um, and it's because uh, there's nuances to, um, to what I'm going to talk about. And likely I'm going to miss things that are important, pieces that, that maybe would help you connect to it. And also, many of you, you don't know me. So you don't know my heart. You don't know my, um, the way I, I treat or communicate with other people. So you could assu- assume things about how I feel about this topic. Don't do that. Go back to God's word. Say, Lord, what does your word say? That's the truth. So what John says, or what I want to believe, uh, we have to defer back to what your word says. And then it's going to go great. What we're covering is the role of the church in the judgment of people. So we're talking about the role of the church in judging people. Um, at the end, we'll do a little bonus on conflict resolu- resolution. But um, let me explain what I mean by this. Even that topic probably doesn't really hit home with you. But judgment, it's, 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 it's hot button because um, the judgment I'm talking about is not uh, eternal judgment. Uh, you know, it's not this person's going to heaven, this person's going to hell. That's, that's not the goal. I think that, that is for God. And at times there's reasons to discern and try to figure out where someone is at. But ultimately God's the only person that knows someone's heart. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm t- talking about is judgment from men. Uh, me to someone else. You to someone else. Uh, judgment from one sinful person to another sinful person. And this is particularly sensitive because of the direction that culture has headed. Uh, you know, tolerance is different now than it used to be. The way that, that someone would describe tolerance, it isn't the same as even probably 10 years ago. Because what tolerance used to be is that one person holds one belief about something or one idea about something and somebody else holds something else. And then they just choose to, to coexist. They don't, they don't have to agree, they just agree to disagree, and that is what tolerance looks like. But now, uh, what tolerance has been transformed into, has been shifted, is that tolerance is instead, you hold this belief, and I hold this belief, and we have to accept the other person's belief to be tolerant. So until you accept it, you are intolerant, and that would make you a bigot. Um, and people may not go quite to that term, but eventually they're gonna get there. And so there's a new tolerance now that tolerance actually means accepting someone's idea, not just being willing to coexist. And so judgment does not fit well in this dichotomy of tolerance, uh, this virtue that is so highly esteemed today. Um, And that means it, it makes it really hard to have civil conversations. It makes it hard to talk to other people about difficult things. Um, in fact, people, they often will start to feel personally assaulted if you challenge an idea. So you don't have to challenge uh, anything personal like, you know, you're the meanest person there ever was. You could just challenge something that they hold deeply and, and, and they're going to feel personally assaulted often. Um, and it isn't just tolerance from, from outside the church that makes this topic kind of difficult, but it's also from strong beliefs that come from within the church. So people in Churches, this church, other churches, uh, there also can be, there's a multitude of things. Like um, if someone feels judged, they'll say, well, there's freedom in Christ. And so they'll, they'll talk about their definition of freedom in Christ. Or um, they'll say, you're shaming me. Don't shame me into believe what you believe. Uh, or to be more Christ-like. Or you're a legalist and you have no grace. So you can't, don't judge me. Or you've got a log in your eye. How can you talk about the sawdust in my eye or whatever? You know, the, or um, the most known and misunderstood. Judge, judge now lest you be judged. How can you judge me? The Bible says you're not supposed to judge. And these are all things that have partial truths in them. So all those things that were said, they actually, they've got some truth, but they're being misapplied, often misapplied, sometimes correctly applied, but uh, I think most often misapplied. 
from those inside the church. We don't want to be judged. And I've been thinking about this topic because I've known I was going to speak on it for a while, and uh, I hit some Facebook gold uh, about three or four days ago. Um, uh, Facebook, man. And uh, I'm going to walk through a discussion that I saw on Facebook, and this is not an endorsement of getting all our stuff out there on Facebook and trying to win debates on Facebook. I actually don't think that's usually the most winsome of places to win arguments or people. Uh, nor do I agree with everything that was said from the party I agree with a lot more than you'll, you'll be able to figure out which one I think is, is probably more on. And I also didn't screenshot it because I, I didn't ask these people if I could use their text, but it was just so compelling. So, um, and it was longer than, if I, did, if I just read the thing, it'd probably be this whole talk. So I, I, I pieced it together and I left out huge portions, but I tried to stay true to what they were saying. I, tried, I didn't try to be dishonest and twist it as much as I could. And so this is how it started. This was the question that got the Facebook feed to light up. It was, want to find out what Christians love? Condemn something secular and watch your comments explode. Want to find out what Christians love? Condemn something secular and watch your comments explode. Kind of a funny post or, you know, because uh, his comments then exploded. And, uh, and there's a couple responses and then someone said specifically, hey man, what do you mean? What, what, what are you trying to say? Like, what, what is the reason for that post to begin with? And I, I labeled this guy the judger because I didn't know what else to call him. Um, so the judger, this is what he had to say. He said, I saw a status questioning how a Christian can watch Game of Thrones with a clear conscience. Now the HBO is actually suing porn sites for using the footage, which sort of ends the debate about whether it's actually pornographic. Unsurprisingly, dozens of rationalizing Christians descended on the comment thread to decry legalism and judgmentalism and declare that it's all good with God if we watch an explicit incest scene, you know, because like, he knows our hearts. So that's what, that was what really got things started. Um, and so there's the judger, and I'm, I'm going to call the other person the offended Christian, the OC. Uh, so we've got the offended Christian who is going to respond. And, and he had, immediately, this was his, his first response. He went to Romans 14, verses 1 through 4. He said, as, and so this is Romans, this is not him, this is what he posted though. Oh, see. As for the one whose faith is weak, accept him into your fellowship, but not for the purpose of quarreling over his opinions. One man's faith permits him to eat anything, while, while the weak believer eats only vegetables to avoid eating ritually unclean meat or something previously considered unclean. The one whose everything is not to look down on the one who does not eat. The one who does not eat meat not, must not criticize or pass judgment on the one who eats everything, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? Before his own master, he stands approved or falls out of favor. And he who serves the master, the Lord will stand, and the Lord is able to make him stand. Okay, sounds pretty good, but we have to know context is everything, right? So um, I think about how did Satan go after Jesus? He didn't pull out the book of Satan. He used God's word and he tried to twist it and manipulate it. So we have to understand what this is talking about. And so the first line sounds pretty convincing. As for one whose faith is weak, accept him into your fellowship, but not for the purpose of quarreling over his opinions. Um, and so I started looking at this passage thinking, what's, what's this passage talking about? Uh, and it's, for one, it's, it's, it's saying, for those who are abstaining from something for the Lord, a preferential thing, or taking part in something preferential that God has blessed, don't judge each other about it. But right before this, at the end of chapter 13, so it's, it's, this is the start of chapter 14, so right before it, this is, what, this is what Paul says. He says, let us walk in decency as in the daylight, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impurity and promiscuity, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on Jesus Christ and make no plans to satisfy the fleshly desires. Walk in decency in the daylight, not carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impurity and promiscuity. And then he goes and he kind of switches the tone a little bit and he starts in this next area. Um, I don't think the OC probably read the passage before when he talked about Romans, the beginning of Romans 14. I think he used that verse totally inappropriately in the context, in this context, that verse has its place and it's true and someone has less faith. I am... Um, I used to live with a guy who was um, 
formerly Hindu, and he, uh, he did not eat beef, and that bothered me a lot um, because I love beef, and I always wanted him to try the burgers and stuff. Like, man, I cooked, eat my food, um, but it was okay. He was a Christian, and it was part of where he came from, and it was hard for him, and I had to accept that it was different. That would be a, a good application of this verse. Um, and then the, the, the OC, he went on, he, he listed another verse. He said, Titus 1.13, he says, rebuke them sharply so that, so that they will sound, be sound in the faith and free from doctrinal error, not paying attention to Jewish myths and the commandments and rules of men who turn their backs on the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the corrupt and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both in mind and their conscience are corrupted. I don't know. I think what he's saying here is that, is that if he believes Game of Thrones, these scenes that specifically he's, he's talking about are pure, then it must be pure. I, I, I don't really know for sure if that's what he's saying, but, but then he, um, he, he's saying it's Jewish myths. He's saying that this is just a, a commandment of man. Because the Bible doesn't say Game of Thrones, uh, then therefore the, you can't apply it in that same um, stringent manner. And then he follows it with this. He says, no, I'm, I'm sorry, but things aren't, this is the OC, I'm sorry, but things just aren't black and white in the world. There's quite a lot of gray and in between. You can see it in the Bible too. Scripture lays out general principles which are black and white, but that doesn't mean every single issue in the world is either absolutely right for everyone or absolutely wrong for everyone. Again, a very true statement. Actually, that was probably one of the better things that he had to say. But I think that he's still misapplying the verses and his ideas are still twisted. So this is what the judger had to say back to him. So, uh, is watching people engage in explicit sexual acts good and acceptable to God according to Scripture? So according to Scripture, is that, is that a good thing? And then the OC says, look, I don't really be, appreciate being talked down to, Okay. He doesn't answer the question. He says, I don't appreciate you looking down on me for what I do. Uh, the judge says, still no, resp- still no response to the yes or no question. Uh, the OC says, uh, what the hell do you want me to say? That you're right? Okay, congratulations, you're right. And me, my sister, her husband, all my friends are terrible, horrible people, and we could only be as holy and righteous as you are. Uh, but dang it, we just love sin too much. Uh, Ooh, right? He, he's feeling attacked. But really, he just posed a question. What, is, what would God say about it? And that brought this huge response from him, this, this deep down response. And this is the way that, that when people feel parts of their lives are being criticized, no one likes to be criticized. I, I don't like to be criticized. I bet you don't like to be criticized, rightly or wrongly. We don't, it doesn't feel good inside of us. Um, and I like that the judge about that question is he doesn't ask about Game of Thrones. He says, let's look at the issue, not the show. Let's look at the issue. The issue is, is it okay to watch explicit sexual acts to honor God? Yes or no? This is the, this is the heart of, of the original post to begin with. Um, and there's no answer, nothing to do except for lash out because the, the answer is obvious. That would not honor God. It's not an act of faith toward God. And so my point all this isn't to show that Game of Thrones is just this bad show. I've never seen it. I don't know anything about it other than mostly what's on this thread and that pe- other people really like it. Um, but it's to show uh, how people respond when they're pushed uh, about something that they feel like um, maybe is a gray area, maybe they haven't thought of. Or when they feel judged, there's going to be a push back. And society will always push back. And a few other people weighed in during, the, during the, this long discussion. And there's two of them I pulled out I liked. It said, one says, I'm a firm believer that it's not our place to judge, criticize, or condemn anyone. We haven't walked in their shoes. And ultimately, our opinions aren't important, only God's. Okay, hey, we don't know what they're going through. Um, how can I condemn someone else? How can I criticize someone else? Isn't that just for God? And the next person, another person, um, said, why condemn when you can rejoice? <laughs> uh, man, it's not ours to judge. Look only at ourselves. Only you and God know if you and your actions are humble. And I cry foul over this comment strongly. Um, 
Not that it's mine to condemn. I'm not, you know, it's not my, my goal isn't to condemn. But, but what she's saying is, is I live my life, you live your life. We do not intermingle. I cannot have any analysis about someone else. Um, and it brings me to the, to the point of the message tonight. Uh, is it really true that, that all interactions are just between person and God? And that the interactions, the judgments of others are not appropriate? Um, is there such thing as, as um, absolute truth? Can things be, be right or be wrong? How do we handle the word of truth? When God says something that's true for me and it's true for others, how does that apply to the people around me? How should I interact with God's word um, when, uh, when someone feels that I'm in conflict or I feel that someone else is in conflict? So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about judgment in the church and how the church is meant to be a blessing. And to do that, uh, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 5, chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. That's actually the whole chapter. And Paul is explaining how to handle sin in the church. And we're using this passage, um, it's kind of extreme, I know, um, but, it, but it's a, a really big picture that, that shows something to us, that demonstrates, will demonstrate something to all of us. And so we're going to read it together. Before we read it, um, know a little bit about Corinthians. Uh, the Corinthian church, Corinth, it was, Paul had spent a year and a half there, so he's, he, he spent time there, he knows it. Uh, it's a major shipping, commerce city. Uh, goods are moving in and out, that, that gives it more transient, peop- transient people, there's more corruption, more immorality. Um, I think it's Epaphrodite, has a temple there, that's right, Aphrodite, has a temple there. There's, they had at one point a thousand um, female priest, priestesses, I, I can't say that word, um, but prostitutes, temple prostitutes. Um, not necessarily at, exactly at this time that he was there, but, but that's the kind of city that it was in. The temple is still there. Uh, and so it's a very corrupt city. But there's a church there. The Spirit of God is there. Something is happening there. And so Paul, he writes this letter back and he has some concerns. So starting in verse 1, if you have a Bible, I'm, it's probably behind me. Um, maybe not. Yeah, it is. Cool. Um, here we go. It is widely reported that there is sexual immorality among you, the kind of sexual immorality that is not even tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is living with his father's wife, and you are inflated with pride instead of grief. Said so he who has committed this act might be removed from your congregation. For though I am absent in body but present in spirit, I've already decided about the one who has done this thing as though I were present. When you assemble the name of our Lord Jesus with my spirit and with the power of our Lord Jesus, turn that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast permeates the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old yeasts that you may be a new batch. You are indeed unleavened, for Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us observe the feast, not with old yeast, or with the yeast and malice, yeast of malice and evil, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of this world, the greedy, the swindlers, or idolaters. Otherwise, you'd have to leave the world. But now I'm writing for you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer who is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or verbally abusive, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? Don't you judge those who are inside? But God judges outsiders. Put away the evil person from among yourselves. Okay. So what's happening here? Paul, he's addressing one specific issue, and then he says this issue has implications that are not just about what's happening here. Because he, 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 he broadens his scope, right? Because he's talking about sexual morality in the church. But he says, but also the greedies, the idolaters, the swindlers. Um, but, but we're going to start with this, this first issue, the most present one, the reason he wrote it. And he says, hey, someone is sleeping. Um, the inference is that they're sleeping with their stepmom. That's what's going on. Uh, it's kind of perverted, it's weird, gross, all of these things. And, um, and so he says, uh, he's, uh, what's, go- what's going on? 
You should be sad about this. There should be grief, but you're proud about it. And so th this, is, this is what he then gives them instruction about. And this, this is the instruction that we're going to pull tonight. But this is the point of the talk. Here it is. You ready? You can write this down if it's not on there. God calls the church to humbly judge one another, to sanctify the church, and to sanctify the believer. God calls on the church to humbly judge one another, to sanctify the church, and to sanctify the believer. Okay, there's like a ton of caveats on that, so you got to be careful as if you just if you stop there and, and think that that's the message. It's not, but <clears throat> this is one of the roles of the church. This is one part of the body of Christ, and so we're gonna look at that first. How does judgment sanctify the church? How does that work? Um, and before we can talk about judgment, we, I have to remind you, it's not about eternal. I'm not talking about eternal judgment, right? That's between um, man and person and God. I'm talking about um, a judgment of an action, a judgment of an action of another person, judgment of sin. Is something right or is something wrong? Is it okay or is it not okay? And so let's look at this sin specifically. There's some, some important things to note about this sin that he's addressing. Uh, first is that the sin has not been repented of. Uh, so, um, it, it, it seems that he's still living with his father's wife. Not he lived, it's happening, so it's present. So there's a, a sin that, that is active and unrepented of. Uh, the second thing is that, is that the church is complicit because of its indifference. The church doesn't care. They think, oh, it's fine. Oh, it's fine. Um, and I was confused about that. Why do you think that is? I, I have some ideas. Um, like how maybe, uh, I think it's in Romans, it says, so sin may increase, that grace would increase all the more. Is that why? Were they like, well, God, Jesus has forgiven me, therefore, yeah, this guy's doing something that normally would have been kind of weird, but, you know, Jesus died for it, and it's probably fine. I don't know. That might have been the reason. Um, I don't have a great answer about why the church um, was proud of it. And maybe it's a pride in the sense that, that um, they're proud that he's a part of them, or they're pride, I don't know. Um, but the church is committed to it instead of um, being against it. They're not saddened over how it is perverting the gospel. The third thing is that sin, the sin is objective. Paul doesn't need to find a motive. He doesn't need to assume. He can just look and say, yes, this breaks God's law. This breaks um, specifically things that Jesus said. It breaks the Ten Commandments. This is, this is wrong. And then the, the, the fourth thing is that the sin, it's, it's in principle, not preference. It's not like Paul's like, man, I just don't like it, um, so you better not do it anymore, and therefore we're going to take these strong actions. It's actually um, a directly in opposition. It's a principle. And so Paul, he wants the Corinthians to see how wrong the sin is. And so what's he do? He says, look at the rest of the city. Look around. Um, they wouldn't be okay with this. Like... Remember Corinth? I mean, we, we have temple prostitutes galore. You can, you know, immorality is what we do best. But really, incestuous, your father's wife, family, the city wouldn't be okay with this. There's actually a verb, a Greek verb that meant to Corinthize, which meant to practice sexual morality. These people, to Corinthize, are not okay with you and what you're doing. The Gentiles, they're not okay with it, and yet this is what you're you're doing. The people, <clears throat> the congregation, how can God's people say this is okay? Shouldn't the church of God be different? Shouldn't it be set apart? Should it be the same as Corinth or even a little more twisted to show that God's grace is that much better? The church of God should be different. The bride of Christ should be different. 1 Peter 1, it says that, that you should be holy for I am holy, dedicated to God, completely and holy to God, set apart, different than anyone else. That's what it means to be holy. Be holy like me. I'm holy. In the same way, I want you to be holy. I want the church of God to be holy and separate. And, and I've given you this body of Christ. I've given you one another, the church and 1 Corinthians 12, which he's working towards, and Ephesians 4, they both talk about the body. They both describe the body. 
Um, and just with our body now, this, this, it's an analogy to, to the, how God works together, like we're all parts of it, and then Christ is the head. Um, what happens when your body doesn't work, right? Like uh, something in your body is dysfunctional. Um, maybe you ate at Abelardo's one too many times. Like what happens? Something is going wrong. You're either throwing up, um, maybe you're throwing up the other direction, you, whatever it is, something is amiss with your body, right? It's not functioning properly together. Or, um, you know, what if you're anemic, meaning you're not getting enough iron? Uh, anemia, if, if, you, if you're not getting enough iron, it doesn't just like shut down one little part of you, right? It makes you weak, lethargic, it can give you headaches, uh, fatigue, irregular heartbeats, shortness of breath. All these things happen in the rest of the body because you're not getting enough iron. Your body stops working the way it's supposed to. In Ephesians 4, 16, this is what it says. From him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. Okay, as every part works together, the body it gets built up and it gets stronger. Um, but what happens if it's, things aren't working together properly? What happens then? Well, I think uh, you get anemic. You get the body, actually the entire body gets hurt because of the sin of one or the sin of two. It could be the sin of the whole church, but, but it just takes one to make the rest of the body be out of whack. And so the church is the bride of Christ, and it's to be perfect and spotless and holy. Uh, and so the church needed to address the issue, not allow it to continue. And so they're to take this unrepentant person still living in the act of sin and actually expel them from the congregation, allow them to go. That's what it says in verse 2, are you inflated with pride instead of filled with grief so that he who has committed this act might be removed from your congregation. Take them out of the body. Remove them from the body. Again, it says the same thing in verse 4 and verse 5. So why? Why, do, why does this person go out of the body? And he describes it like yeast, like dough from a batch. Let me see hands. How many of you ever made friendship bread? Anyone? One, couple, all right. All right, friendship bread. Friendship bread is awesome. And if you have some, send it to me. I'll be your friend. My wife will be your friend. But it's... um. It's this recipe, I don't know. But it, it, what it is is these bags of gooey nastiness that one person gives to their friends. They, they pass it out. And then you get a recipe with it. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. This is, I've watched this done. I've never done it myself. But you get a recipe with it. And then, and then what you're to do is you add some ingredients into this bag of nastiness. And then the yeast does its thing. And then you separate it again, and then you hand those other bags out, and what you have left is this little gooey grossness that you put other baking ingredients in, and you make really delicious bread. It's really good. Um, this is what friendship bread is. And so someone has to get it started, and then, and then everyone, and then it just keeps spreading. It spreads and spreads and spreads until like four people don't have friends or whatever, you know, that, I guess that would be the first one, and then it ends. But this is what it looks like. It, what's happening, I think, is, is the yeast. It's, it's getting in there. It's doing its work. It's, it's um, prepping the bread to be made. And this is what it's talking about in this passage when he talks about uh, the yeast and the dough. Um, verse 6, your boasting is not good. Don't you know a little yeast? It permeates the whole batch of dough. Clean out the old yeast so that you, so that you may be a new batch you are indeed unleavened, for Christ the, pras the Passover has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us who has committed the act be removed for, oops, observe the feast. Let me start that over again. Therefore, let us observe the feast now with old yeast or with the yeast of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He says, okay, so there's this bread uh, and it's corrupt. And with the friendship bread, think about it. If you spread out your friendship bread, but it's bad then what's everyone's bread going to be like? Corrupted, terrible, disgusting. Don't pass me that friendship bread, please. But if, if it goes out and it's good, the starting point is good, it's good for everyone. And in Christ, you become a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That's what's getting described here. He says, you're, you're a new dough. Something is different. You want to be of sincerity and of truth, not of malice and of evil. 
This is, you're the new batch. Get rid of your old self. Purge the unrepentant sinner. Get them out because they're corrupting everything else. They're going to get into everything else. And so the church, it gets sanctified. The church gets purified by taking someone in sexual sin, unrepentant sin, and taking them out of the church. And if you see that, that is judgment. They're judged for the benefit of the rest of the church, to make the rest of the church holy, to, to, to help all of you, to help me, that person is asked to no longer be around. Remember those things about them, though. It's not, this can be confusing. I think one of the reasons this is confusing is because I'm a sinner, right? Okay, so do I have to leave? Uh, you know, I know this, this week I've lusted my heart. Does that mean that I have to be out of the church? Because that's what Jesus talked about, adultery is lust in the heart. The difference here is it's someone, remember, they've, they've got unrepented sin. They're currently living in the sin, uh, the church is complicit in its action. The church is okay with it. There's elements that aren't just a person is a sinner. Because the church is a place for sinners to come and be welcome. But repentant sinners, right? People who have a heart towards God or people who are saying, is God real? We're going to get to that more in a little bit too. So the first thing about judgment is actually it's a blessing to the church. It's a gift for all of us to sanctify the church. The second thing about judgment is that you know, it, judgment is for the believer. It's to sanctify the believer. Verse four, when you're assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus with my spirit and with the power of our Lord Jesus, turn that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Help him. Help him that when he dies, he sees who God is. Um, I recently heard sin is described as a, a sugar, um, let's see, poison, sugar-coated poison. This is what sin is. People, it's sugar-coated poison. We put it in, we eat it, and it tastes really good, and it goes inside, and it just kills us. It destroys us. And um, <clears throat> that was really a helpful description for me, and that's been my experience with my own sin. Uh, it feels good in the moment, and then later I'm like, why, why did I do that? And I, I, I fight myself, and I war, and, and God's grace is real, and his forgiveness is real, but, but it, th these moments of sin, these prolonged times of sin, uh, and so judgment, it's for the believer to help them see that. And, and so as you remove the believer from fellowship, what you're doing is you're taking them out of, of something that God has really gifted. So uh, it, it's easy to forget because you're in it so often, but you know, when you leave for like, two, three, four weeks, and you're outside of fellowship of, of stronger believers, um, maybe go back to your old church, and it's really great, but you don't have the friends that you have here, people to help, help you live for God. It's easier to fall back into sin, right? It's easier to kind of go astray, because God's blessed us with each other and with, with fellowship. And, and with this, what he's saying is, is, is remove that person, because they're experiencing the blessing that you all are experiencing right now. Like if they're sick, someone's gonna bring them soup uh, who loves Jesus. Great. Uh, if they need a ride, they call someone from the church, I need a ride, no problem. Um, there's so many benefits. I need prayer, pray for me. I'm going through this thing. There's people here who will do that and you, you guys have that blessing every day. It's available to you. But if you're outside of it, you feel the void. And so... When someone is living in unrepentant sin, you take them and you remove them from fellowship. You remove them from the blessing that God has given, that God has provided for us. Why? That their spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. That they would repent and they would turn to God. And going back to that, um, that, that sin is like a sugar-coated poison. It, it, imagine if you're in the hospital. This person's in the hospital, and they just keep getting sick. What they keep doing is they keep eating the poison, right? So they're in the bed, and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm hungry, and I'm eating this poison, and it tastes so good, and then it makes me sick. And then the doctor just gives you the antidote. They just fix you again, and they fix you again. You eat, and they fix you again. You eat, and they fix you again. Eventually, the hospital is going to say, listen, stop eating or leave, Right, like, like you're, you are actually killing yourself slowly. You don't see it, but you're really dying slowly. And so you either need to get off this thing that you're doing um, or you need to go. 
that they would experience the pain because what would happen is they would leave, they would eat the poison, they'd come to a place where they're totally sick and then they would come in completely at their lowest of lows and they would need help from the doctor and they would help them. I think it's similar, that's similar to what he's describing here. He says, remove them, that they would feel the weight of sin and then they'd be able to come back and they'd be right with God because what matters is not today, what matters is eternity. I love that. And so this isn't a, a judgment of pride. Paul isn't saying, you church are better than this person. It's saying, ch- church, help this person to look and see God in a different way. Remove them that they would know their need for God. And so it's not, um, it's not proud in asking someone and in, in judging someone's sin. Luke 7, one of my favorite passages, I refer to it frequently. Jesus is with this Pharisee. When he encounters a a prostitute, she comes and she's cleaning his feet with her hair. And uh, and so she's wiping and she's got tears, she's kissing his feet. And the Pharisee gets self-righteous and he thinks, if Jesus just knew who this woman was, he would be like, scram. And Jesus reads his thoughts, kind of a scary thing. And then... uh, and he says, hey, listen, Mr. Pharisee, uh, if someone's forgiven $50 and someone's forgiven $500, both debts are forgiven, which one would love him more? And the Pharisee says, the one with the greater debt forgiven. He says, that's right. Whoever is uh, forgiven little loves little. Whoever is forgiven little loves little. How much have you been forgiven? A lot, Right? And so as we experience the the weight of sin, as we experience the depth of our depravity, it actually turns us back to God. God, I need your help. And in the long run, that person becomes much more fruitful for God and his kingdom as his heart turns in humility and repentance back toward God. Judgment in the church in this area is for the believer. It's a blessing. It's a grace. Okay, judgment third thing is that judgment, it's not for those outside the church. So I'm talking about specifically someone in the church. Judgment, it's not for those outside the church. It says our verse 9, I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of the world or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters, otherwise you'd have to leave the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer who is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, verbally abusive, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? Don't you judge those who are inside? But God judges outsiders. Put away the evil person from among yourselves. Okay, so there's those in the church and those outside the church. And this is where Christians, we get in the most trouble, I think. We judge those outside the church with the standards that the church has. At least people feel that way. And I, 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 I was thinking to myself, and I don't think I do that very often. I just hold people in the church to that standard. Maybe that's because I hang out a lot with people in the church. But as I'm thinking that, I'm sitting at McDonald's, and I'm preparing this talk. Like, I'm thinking about this talk, and... Uh, it was like in between lunch and dinner. I think it was probably, they all had their break at the same time. Bad idea, McDonald's. Um, so they're talking. And I put my headphones on because I was trying not to listen, but I couldn't help myself. And these guys, they said so many terrible things. I mean, they were swearing like crazy, saying inappropriate things to girls, racial slurs. Uh, one of the younger employees who looked like 16, probably 18, tried to buy booze from another McDonald's employee. Like, I can hear these things in my headphones while they're wearing their uniforms, their name tags on. And I was thinking, like, man, I should, like, tell the manager, these are the worst employees ever. You know, like, I do not, you do not want these people working for you. And I'm getting all self-righteous in my mind. And I was like, wait, wait. These people need is not to lose their job. They need the message of the gospel. They need Christ. They're hopeless. The way they're talking, the way they're thinking, it's, it's not... It's just a reflection of society. I'm an idiot. I'm talking about, this is the very topic of the thing I'm talking about. I need to love these guys. I need to be less than these people. I'm not better than them. I'm less than them. Christ died for them too. 
And it gets confusing in the church because we just, it's so easy to hold other people to our standards. But we also face an epidemic in America um, that makes this passage difficult in that I don't know the exact number, but, but many, most people in America identify as Christians. And so how do I determine who's a Christian and who's not a Christian? Who comes to these standards that God puts in his word and who doesn't? Um, do I look at the fruit? Like, hey, yeah, this guy, he's, um, he's grown in peace. You know, he's grown in patience. And he saw, you know, his sibling come to Christ. He's definitely a Christian. And, oh, this person, he's been more angry lately. It's like, no, no. That's not my call to make. That's not my, what I'm supposed to do. This text gives us a guideline. Verse 11 it says, but now I'm writing that you not associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, who's sexually immoral or greedy, idolater, verbally abusive, drunkard, swindler, don't even eat with such a person. You see, it doesn't really matter. If someone's a Christian or not, what matters is what do they claim to be? If they claim to be a believer. And the reason that is, is because that's how other people identify God. So, so they'll say, what is the Christian God like? Well, this guy's a Christian, and he's sleeping with his stepmom. The Christian God's okay with that. This, person's, uh, this person says he's a Christian, and he's cheating on his taxes. You know, this, whatever. It's what they claim to be, and, and this is telling because I think I always get fired up about statistics about Christians and divorce being the exact same, like uh, people who claim Christian people, Christ and people who don't claim Christ, the divorce rate's no different. And I always think there's no way that the redeemed people of God hold the same divorce rate as people who don't know Jesus. But this is saying it doesn't really matter. People identify those people as Christians. Okay, so why did I talk about all of this judgment stuff? What is the point of all of this? Because you're probably not going to come across this situation too often, right? I talk about this thing, this subject, because I think it's an area that, as a church, we need to push back a little bit, and we need to grow in our conviction that it's okay to judge sin. Uh, and not judge it in the same way like, yeah, you're sinning, you need to be out of the church, but to have an awareness that I can see sin in someone else's life and recognize it, that it's sin. Um, and what do you do with it? Now, that's, that's the next discussion a little bit. Um, but but I, I just want us to understand the church is actually a, a blessing to us, that it will help us, that you are called to help one another to be sanctified, to be more like Christ, to grow. And as we do that... Uh, and as we understand that my actions affect you and your actions affect me, I think the church gets better and it gets stronger and we want to help one another more. We're not removed, we're not separate. Like they do their thing, I do my thing. No, no. What they do really affects what I do and what I do really affects what they do. And you see that throughout this whole passage, this interweaving of the church and people and how it matters and throughout the entire New Testament for that matter. A little yeast works through the whole dough. Okay, there's a ton of things I want to talk about that I didn't get to. I'm going to hit you with a couple fast ones of, of just, just quick hitters that relate to judgment. Okay, first thing is that God cares way more about honest self-reflection than your judgment of others. So it, this talk probably felt um, strong, I don't know, um, but it's because I was talking specifically about judgment. The word of God actually, what God really wants is for you to, to, to interact with him on a personal level, to, to evaluate your own life, to look at yourself and say, God, how can I grow in you? How can I, the spirit pour out of me? Far more than he wants you to look at the other person and say, that person's wrong in here and here and here. He doesn't want us to have a critical spirit. In fact, he wants our love and our forgiveness to grow towards other people. Let's so be careful about that. A critical spirit um, does not mean right judgment. Second is that, is that um, there are specific sins outlined in this passage, but not all sins should be dealt with in the same way. So I'm just talking to someone. Hey, man, I saw this happen. Have you talked to God about that yet? Have you repented of, of that action? The third thing is that conversations are not judgment conversations on judgment. And this is where we get often confused because we get offended and we want to lash out. K.P. O'Hannon, um, he started Gospel for Asia. He said that he believes the American church needs more conflict. 
They would actually need more conflict. And I think the reason he says that is that we're really okay with each other. Like, if I don't, if I don't challenge you, you won't challenge me, and we can both live happily ever after. He says, I think the church needs actually more conflict, more difficult conversations. And those conversations, they don't, they don't mean judgment. Um, in fact, typically, if I'm going to talk with anyone, I'm going to ask them a lot more questions than I'm going to do talking. Hey, man, uh, it seems like, you know, you've been pretty frustrated lately. Are things okay? Are you doing okay? Um, I'm concerned about you. You know, yeah, you kind of yelled at me the other day. What was that about? Why did you yell at me? You know, are things at home okay? Are things at work okay? Have you been spending your own time with the Lord? Are the things that I've done that made you mad? You know, whatever. Having a conversation is not judgment. It's okay to have conversations. Conversations will be helpful. Uh, the fourth thing is that you're not the judge. Allow God's word to be. That Facebook thread, they, that's one of the things they kept saying is that um, it's just between me and God. And that's right. God's word talks about lots of areas of life. And so what we can do is we can say, well, this is what God's word says. And I believe this is how it's applied. And we might misinterpret. We might be wrong. Um, but we want to use God's word, not our word. The fifth thing is hypocrisy is only a valid argument against what you're saying if you claim to be perfect. If you're humble, you can present your case to others to help them grow. And so when someone says, oh, I hate all Christians, they're all hypocrites. It's like, well, if the person is being self-righteous, then yes, that's, that's not good. But if the Christian says, man, uh, this is where I came from, and actually this is what happened yesterday, and I'm not the best person in the world to even talk about this, but, but I love you and I want to talk to you about this thing, um, then you're not a hypocrite. You're being honest. You need Jesus too, right? You need the Savior to come and redeem you. And daily, we need to be reminded that Christ died for my sins and my wrongs. And it's that belief that frees me up to, to be humble and say, yeah, I'm not, I'm not that guy either, but I think I can help you. I care about you. And as people... Um, so many people, they say they don't go to church because they had a bad experience in church. I'm sure you've heard that before. Like, yeah, I got burned by this church. I think sometimes that's true. Um, but I think sometimes what people got burned by was their sin. That, that maybe there was no one that loved them. Maybe there was no, no one explained it, something to them clearly. But often we live in sin, and then we go to church, and we see what we perceive as everyone is perfect, and then we get convicted by the words that are spoken from the word of God. You say, I'm out of here. These, these people, they, they think they're awesome and they think I'm terrible. Um, sometimes people do feel that way, but, but the church is really full of broken people. Um, and the more that we're broken, the more we can embrace God's love, the more we can love other people. And so I think when people have that discussion with you, try to explore what they mean. Hey, what happened in church? Tell me about it. What do you believe about Jesus? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Who's in churches? You can, you can help them work through that. There have been a lot of bad experiences too, so I'm not saying it's always the case. The seventh thing, helping someone grow in Christ is a grace from God, and it's a gift to them. If you want to grow, to grow in Christ, it's a grace from God. It's a gift to them. I'm, I'm going to just fire through here, and then Christians can and should interact with people who are not Christians. Uh, you should. You should. We shouldn't just hang out with each other. We should actually embrace people around us, talk to people around us, people who totally are different and disagree. Um, I love golfing with people who aren't Christians. I was in a golf league for two summers with some neighbors, and it was great. And, um, and people's character comes out on the golf course. Um, and they would like, sometimes they'd have a bad day, and they would just curse up a storm. But then they would see me, and they'd be like... Mm. And they'd look at me and they'd be like, oh, sorry, John. You know, they knew I'm a pastor and, and, and they'd be embarrassed about it. Um, they knew I was a Christian. I loved that golf league. I loved being able to talk with those guys and be their friend and know that we're coming from a totally different place. Um, it was a great thing. It provided me good opportunities. Okay. This is, this is why we talk about, I think hopefully you, you're with me um, I feel like I talked about a lot of things in a lot of different ways. Um, hopefully you, you took something from it. I want to finish talking briefly about um, conflict. Um, because conflict, I've been talking specifically about judgment, but judgment will lead to conflict. As, as someone...
goes through something that they're going to, um, inevitably you're going you're to fight with one another and each of you are going to fight with each other. And so I want to talk a few things about what it looks like to resolve conflict between two Christians. Hopefully this will be helpful to you. Uh, I don't know if it's my, it's probably my sharp tongue. I've gotten myself into a lot of trouble before. And so I've had to do a lot of conflict. At the same time, when I was in eighth grade, I, I was a conflict manager, uh, which was awesome. That meant that I got to leave class and I had people read this piece of paper that had like, I feel when you, because I, statements. I, know, I hope you know what I'm talking about. But the Bible has a lot to say about conflict. And I want to just provide a couple things. I have a piece of paper for you that, that I want you to read your next time alone, you know, the Lord, whatever, just next time you get a free 20 minutes to read through it. Um, but it's, as Christians, God really wants us to be united. He wants us to have complete heart and soul unity with one another, that there wouldn't be any impurity between us. Um, in Matthew 5, 21, Luke talked about this a little bit, but if someone has something against someone, they go to sacrifice an animal. So they go to the temple, and they're going to sacrifice this animal. What it says is if you have something against another brother, leave your sacrifice at the altar and go back, make things right, and then come back and sacrifice your animal. Well, that seems just fine because I live, you know, 10 minutes by car from this location. But they're talking like days of walking. Like they would walk, they might walk a couple days all the way to get to the temple. And then he says, but if you have something that's, that's wrong with your brother, leave your animal, walk days back, make it right, and come back. God has this really high desire for unity, a really high call for all of us, all of you, to be united with one another. And I think the reason is that we are the ones who show the love of Christ. We're the ones, the way that we interact with one another, by this all men and you are my disciples. How you love one another. And so when we have things wrong with each other, we need to work them out. So how do you do it? Well, Matthew 18, it lays it out pretty clearly, hopefully. Uh, it says, if your brother sins against you, go rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you have won a brother. You gotta work it out. When, when, when someone, when you feel you've been wronged, go to that person. Uh, confront the issue privately. If they don't repent, uh, take another person with you. If it still doesn't get resolved, bring it before the church. But um, one of my favorite verses is in Romans 12. It says, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. As much as it depends on me, be at peace with everyone. And so to do that, we don't need to confront every offense. We don't hold non-Christians to the same standard. We need to be humble. Um, there's so many things, but the root of it is this. God wants us to be unified, to show love towards one another. It's okay to, to have a discerning eye towards sin and things that are wrong. Um, but we want to work in unity. We want to show Christ in our relationships with one another in the church. We want to help people be restored with God. Okay, uh, let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you gave us the church. You gave us the entity of the church, a, a group of people who will work together for you. That you give us each other as safeguards, Lord, to, to work with one another, purify one another. I know that you're the purifier, but we help each other come to the conclusions we need to. I pray, Lord, that, you, that you'd help us to abide in you, to tap into the spirit, uh, to tap into your word. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to, to love the people around us. I pray that we would view sin like you view sin. That we'd see that we've been forgiven just as much as the murderer, just as much as the drug dealer, just as much as, um, as everyone who's sinned against you and put you on the cross. Help us to love in an amazing way. I pray you'd... Um, Guide our lives, guide our relationships, help us to be discerning. Amen.